ABC Listen. Podcasts, radio, news, music and more. Today is a story of family secrets, endurance and a fortune teller's prediction come true. Actor Heather Mitchell's career on stage and screen has spanned more than four decades. Her most recent role as former US Supreme Court Judge Ruth Bader Ginsburg was hailed by one critic as one of the greatest solo performances on the Sydney stage in almost half a century. Heather is that good. On the screen, you've seen her in everything from Muriel's Wedding to Love Me. Off stage, Heather has navigated loss and twice survived cancer. Her most important roles in life have been as daughter, wife, mother and treasured friend to many. Heather has now written a book called Everything and Nothing about her remarkable life. Heather, welcome to Conversations. Thank you so much. Heather, how did your mum and dad, Red and Shirley, first meet? My parents met in Shanghai the first time they met. My mother had flown over as a young girl of 19 after finishing school at Sydney Girls High. She got a course in shorthand and typing and then scored a job with Arthur Lowndes through the United Nations and they went over there to do relief and rehabilitation work. So she flew over there, I think sort of against her parents, not against their wishes, but I think they were all rather nervous about her going. Um, The war had just ended And she went over there and was working primarily with orphan children and children who were displaced after the war. And my father, who was American, had grown up in Kansas and then upstate New York, had driven his motorbike across America after studying silver culture, which is um, forestry, planting of trees and soil erosion. And um, he was in Hawaii during the war as a conscientious objector, and he sailed on a boat, I think with some brethrens, he got passage and then went with the United Nations also to um, do reforestation and tractor and erosion control work. And they met in Shanghai at the Peace Hotel. How similar were they and, and how different were your parents to each other? There were many, many similarities. The similarities were very much to do with their, their beliefs about life. They held very similar ideas they didn't believe in owning things particularly or taking possession of things. They they saw the world, saw the world as a place that would welcome them wherever they went. When it came to politics, my mother was much more politically engaged than my father, who didn't sort of talk about politics or engage in it very much. But they were very different in personality. My mother was much more gregarious and outgoing and loved being around people. My father was much more introverted, uh, more shy and uh, very ref- reflective person, a very person who thought very deeply about issues in the world. And my mother was, I suppose, more responsive to things, more sort of spontaneous. Where were you born, Heather? I was born in Seoul in Korea in 1958, uh, where my parents were for, I think they were there for two to three years. And my mother, each time she had a child, there were only three siblings, she fostered a child also. So we had a young boy called Inchul, who I think was born on the same day as me, who she fostered. I don't really remember him particularly well, but I do have memories of being in Seoul. I remember the snow and I remember sun on the snow, particularly. They're really sensory memories. Yeah, I have very strong sensory memories. But I think they loved being in Seoul. They certainly loved being with the Korean people. My parents always spoke very lovingly and affectionately about the Korean culture and about the Korean people. After three years in Seoul, your family moved to Kingston in Jamaica, of mm-hmm. all places, for a couple of years. What, what was that like, Heather? Uh, look, I do have vivid <laughs> memories of um, Jamaica. We had this small house, but a beautiful house, very open to the garden, uh, we had many, many trees and plants and uh, my father built us each, each of us our own little sort of cubby house. We had many friends. It was a very social, happy time. It was a very, very happy time. What do you remember of, of the smells of the garden and the oh, house? There was such pungent, wonderful smells. I remember the smells of, you know, from the frangipani and from the breadfruits and the um, the guavas and the mangoes in particular. And there was just so much fruit all the time. It was really beautiful. My parents loved um, square dancing. So there were a lot of parties, a lot of, 
adults in colourful skirts and I don't know, it was just a very colourful, beautiful time. <laughs> After the adventure of Jamaica, the, the family settled in Camden, which is about 65 kilometres from Sydney. I can't imagine the contrast in those two places. What brought your parents to Australia? Well, my mother was a Sydney girl, was brought up in Coogee in a very loving Jewish family. She adored her parents and she had two sisters who she was very, very close to who both lived in Strathfield. So we came to Australia very much for her to be reunited with her family. And her mother was becoming elderly and I think she wanted to be closer to her mother. They made a really wonderful life living in Camden. What did Camden look like at that time? What were your impressions as a kid arriving there? I don't remember the shock of it or anything. I think my brother and sister who were older could definitely see the contrast much more than I did. We didn't live on a farm. We lived right in a very suburban house near the highway. But the walks I loved walking from our place to where the school was through the town. Huge jacaranda trees, beautiful sort of playing fields, lovely old established homes, and then very close to the city with a, you know, dairy farming and market gardening. And uh, look, I adapted to it very quickly and I loved it. What was your family home like with your mum gregarious and wanting lots of people in the house, your dad wonderful with the garden? It sounds kind of idyllic, Helen. Look, it was such a a very modest, red brick, rather boring house. And my parents, when I think they decided, they realised they'd be staying, they really threw themselves into the garden and my mother would direct my father as to, you know, how to design the land landscape. But our home was a very quiet, gentle place. It wasn't full of noise and activity. Both my parents were very gentle people. I don't recall anyone ever raising their voice in our family even. It was very quiet. Um, a lot of music being played. Um, my father played the guitar. So there was a lot of music and there was a lot of um, conversation. My mother and I both loved reading together. Um, she had a great love of poetry and literature. You know, it's quite easy to romanticise one's past and, and only remember good things or only remember difficult things. But I have to say, whether I fabricated it or not, my memories are very vividly positive and happy memories of my childhood and of growing up. Heather, you've said that it felt to you like you'd met your mum in a previous life, that mm-hmm. you already knew her, which is a really interesting perspective. What, what did you mean by that? It's interesting. I always felt I knew her and I do have a memory which I, my first real memory was of her face and I do remember her face and I really do think it was when I was a baby, like when I was very young. Not her whole face, just her her looking at me. And I remember a feeling of, of absolute recognition. I can't think of another word to describe it except that I knew her and I have always felt a deep connection with her and I still do. You think back to that childhood time, you're talking about life at home. How were things for you at school? Um, Look, I enjoyed school. I made good friends and I really loved my teachers. I I didn't realise I was struggling at school because I I think I enjoyed the social aspects of school so much. I didn't sort of realise that I was probably slipping behind academically. Um, And it wasn't really until... I think I realised to myself that I was pretending to be coping well and that I was also had been cheating quite a bit, (laughs) Uh, looking at other people's work or, you know, sneaking glances at things or looking at the back of the textbook where the answers were (laughs) and asking my father more regularly for help with assignments and doing things, which he was always obliging to do, and then realised that reading was the really difficult thing for me. And that when I tried to describe to my father that things were jumping around a bit or reversing almost, that certain letters, I couldn't quite grasp what they were. And we understand now that is dyslexia. Uh, And I don't think I had an extreme case of it, but I definitely had it. So my father really ingeniously painted the inside of my wardrobe door with blackboard paint and left some white chalk there. And I discovered, and I don't know how he knew to do this, that I would, if I dressed up as one of my teachers and put on one of my mother's sort of skirts that was in a suitcase in the cupboard and and put some pearls on and a pair of shoes and pretended to be a teacher 
who seem to have great knowledge of everything <laughs> uh, and great insights into their students that I could put the imaginary me on the bed and on the sitting on the edge of the bed and I'd take notes during the day or copy things from other people's things. And then because I'd written them down already, I could understand them and they were in shorthand. And then I'd write with the white chalk on black and teach myself. And through the art of speaking it rather than it all being writing, so I'd say, now, Heather, do you understand that A plus B equals, what? what is it? C, that's right, C. And so I'd test myself and I'd, <laughs> it sounds ridiculous, but it worked. It was wonderful. And I would congratulate myself and I'd give myself, I had little gold stars, I'd give myself merit cards. You know, I really treated myself as if I was a wonderful student who was doing brilliantly. So therefore I kept my confidence up and it worked brilliantly. That was, a Heather, an incredibly kind and insightful thing that your dad did for you that opened up this world and this way for you. Yes, and I'm not sure how he knew that the white on black would help so much because now we have computer screens where you can reverse that. But then, you know, I don't recall seeing white writing on black or how he... <laughs> we did have a book called The Chalk Garden, I remember, where it was black pavement with chalk drawings. And it was one of my favourite books. And maybe he saw that and thought, well, try this. But it was very insightful of him. I'm really interested in your imagination as well, becoming this teacher to, to teach yourself. Who was this character, Mrs Mumford, based on? It wasn't based on any one teacher. I had had, there was a school principal at um, primary school. Her name is Miss Mudford. And um, she was quite a, a strict woman a uh, very good principal, but very strict. And I think I took a bit of her, but changed it to mum and made her Miss Mumford. And so she was a much more loving version of that woman. So she wasn't any one particular woman, but she was just this woman who was very caring, very loving, and very determined that Heather would would cope well and, and do well. Heather, another example of your dad's lovely problem-solving uh, approach was that in the house, he set up a suggestion box to <laughs> kind of try and keep the peace or have some level of democracy. Tell us about that. How did that work? Uh, well, my parents were very into conflict resolution and um, they were pacifists and my father was a Quaker, so he believed absolute pacifism and um, non-violence. So we had a suggestion box, which sat was just a cardboard box, sat on top of the laundry box at the end of the hallway. And if you felt anything you know, very strongly if you were particularly angry about something or felt there was an injustice or, you know, even if it was someone using your towel or something, I don't know, it could be, <laughs> it could be petty and it could be much more, more serious, you would write it down anonymously and fold it and put it in the suggestion box. And once a week or maybe it was once a fortnight, my father would open the box at the dinner table, I think on a Friday night, and uh, read out the suggestions. It was a wonderful example of... When you feel things intensely, sometimes that is the time to express it and sometimes it's not. And I think it very much taught me that usually it's not the right time. It's better <laughs> to sit on it or better to, <laughs> better to reflect on it. And then you can find humour in it later. When did you first notice that your mum was spending more time in bed? My mother started to get tired. My memory is that she would lie down. And sometimes we always went for a walk in the evenings after dinner, we'd often go for a walk and she stopped coming on the walks or she'd only walk partway and lie down. So I began a little suspicious that something was, was not right, but it was never discussed. So when something's not discussed and when you're being taught not to question things and not to express those feelings necessarily, uh, if you're having them, but to sort of sit on them and try and work them out, there was sort of an agreement a silent agreement not to talk about it. What did your mum look like as she started to become more and more ill, but you still weren't quite sure what was happening? Um, she was a very beautiful woman. She was very uh, long and lean and she had very long limbs. And I remember she'd often have her nightie, which was quite long. And every now and then I'd see, you know, um, sores on her legs, which were not healing. And that was always alarming bruising, sort of that sort of blood bruising. But then with the different medications, she would then start to swell. You know, the body then starts to uh, maintain fluid and as the organs aren't working as well. 
But, you know, there again, when you love someone so much and if there is not the permission to discuss what's going on, I think everything becomes normal. Normal is what is normal. And so uh, there's always a voice inside saying something's wrong, something's really wrong here, and there's a sort of a a general panic. Uh, But there's an agreement that everything will be as normal. So that was the overriding thing not to um not to address it were you worried even in that kind of state worry is not a word that i associate with it i think i did exactly the same thing i would go to my bedroom i loved being in my bedroom creating things and i had a wonderful book called um the family of man which was 503 black and white brilliant photographs all american by striken of images of people, men, women, children, in very dramatic situations of grief and loss and war and natural catastrophes. All the photographs are them at this point of incredible conflict and tension. And I loved this book and I loved going to my room and there were a couple photographs in particular of women who were very intensely staring into the distance or holding each other and weeping. And I would create, recreate these women in my room by, you know, dressing like them with, you know, using tea towels and on my head (laughs) and, you know, and um, sort of comforting, I suppose, really, I was comforting myself, but I was trying to recreate the feeling of grief in myself in anticipation of the grief that was yet to come. And I felt that by doing that, I had developed an empathy for my mother because I could see she was grieving for herself and Mm. probably for her undeniable journey towards death Mm. and also grieving for leaving her children and her husband and leaving life. So I played her at times. I put her into these women and other times I would comfort myself. So I'd hold a pillow and comfort the dying dying baby or the baby who's lost its mother. And so I'd create little stories and scenarios and that made me feel so full and powerful and empowered because I could access those feelings. And I felt they were so real. It's like anything, when you feel something intensely afterwards, whether it's a positive or negative experience, if you've lived through it and you survive it, you feel extraordinary. And it was the same feeling. I felt somehow that I could face grief from a very young age and overcome it and be comfortable with it. So when she did eventually die, I did not feel, of course, I was terribly sad and um, cried and felt for my father and my siblings and her, you know, her sister, but I didn't feel grief for myself. I felt I'd already experienced that. It's quite extraordinary, Heather. It's almost preparing and training for this thing that no one in the house is talking about. Yeah. It helped me so much in my life having done that as a child. I didn't realise that's why I probably became an actor was because of those early experiences. But clearly it is because the I think I spent many years once I became an actor of moving away from that, of thinking of acting as something completely different, like a mask almost, or, you know, taking on other things. And it's only now really in my 60s, it's become very important to me. Heather, can you tell me about your mum's room as she became more and more ill and was spending more time in her room? Often... Despite the heaviness of what's going on, the room of an ill parent can be a place where all sorts of daily activity unfolds. What was your mum's room like for you as a kid when she got sick? It's a great question because, yes, rooms do take on, you know, the the atmosphere and the personality of what's going on. She, her whole bedroom was mauve. My father painted it for her. I don't know why she wanted a mauve bedroom. (laughs) I can't stand the colour mauve. But... (laughs) She had mauve walls and a mauve bedspread and a mauve curtains. And um, it wasn't a large bedroom. It was quite small. There wasn't a lot of room around it to put a chair or anything. So I would often sit on the floor uh, next to the bed. It wasn't a high bed. So you were, you know, she was fairly low to the ground. And it was a beautiful place to be. She rarely wanted people to come into the bedroom who were visitors. She'd always, no matter how unwell she was, she'd brush her hair put on some lipstick and come through to the living room. But the bedroom for for myself and my father and my sister in particular, I found it a beautiful room to be in. 
So Heather, when you were about 11, you came home from school one day and you are getting ready for a debate at school and wanted to ask your mum some advice. What was the topic for that debate? Uh, The topic for the debate was ignorance is bliss. And I was to argue for the government and I sat with mum and we talked about different things and then she said, okay, if someone who you loved knew they were dying, would you want them to tell you? And I had no idea that she was referring to her situation because that very day she had come back from the city where she'd been told that she had leukaemia and that it was terminal. And I was arguing hypothetically for the government and said, no, you know, you wouldn't want to know. You wouldn't want them to tell you because it would change your relationship with them. You might then feel guilty if you get cross with them or whatever. And I was arguing hypothetically, but she took that as a sign that I didn't want to know. Your mum had two sisters. As she was becoming more ill, how how close was she with her her sisters? Oh, she was intensely close. They loved each other enormously. They um, they were very close growing up. They all adored their parents, um, Harold and Rose. And two of the sisters, Audrey and Rosemary, lived within 10 doors of each other in the same street their whole married lives. And Audrey, the one down the road from Rosemary, She was a very glamorous, beautiful woman. But my mother rang her sisters every day. Every day she'd lie on the the bed on the phone and they'd talk for hours. I couldn't imagine what they were talking about, but they'd (laughs) talk for the longest time. (laughs) When did you get a sense, particularly watching your mum and her sisters, when did you get a sense that maybe there were some secrets in the family or things that were unspoken that were going on? Well, firstly, I realised that mum couldn't be telling anyone else because no one else seemed to be worrying about my mother. So that also made me think, oh, maybe there's nothing wrong. But then as things progressed, I thought, how weird it is that she's not telling them, that clearly they don't know. And one of the reasons I knew that was because Audrey, the middle sister, seemed to be rather anxious about my mother. I could sense that she was worried about my mother. And I think it's in all families, really, there are secrets. And As a child, I think your antenna is really alerted to, particularly between the adults, uh, you can sense when adults feel they're being cut out or left out or not being included in what's going on and you become very attuned to that. What what sort of whispers did you start to hear about your auntie Audrey? Well, the really shocking one I heard was the use of the word shock treatment. And I overheard my parents talking about shock treatment and Audrey. And apparently she was, you know, going through menopause and depression and she just could not get the help she needed. And I think that my mother's secrecy about her illness, she was watching the woman she loved more than anything, not confiding in her about her health. And I think she possibly, I'm guessing this, but I'm assuming she felt cut out and she felt deeply alone Um, really drastically and deeply alone. By the time you were a teenager, you had a part-time job at the local pharmacy in Camden. The door of the pharmacy opens and your aunt Audrey comes Mm. in. What do you notice? I remember this day so vividly. She walked into the chemist wearing this white organza suit, which had these flared pants and this big ruffle collar and her hair was always set magnificently and her eyelashes were always like these big false eyelashes and turquoise eyeshadow and big red mouth and she always looked so stunning and particularly in a place like Camden, which was a very sensible place. She looked very out of place, but I was so proud of her. And she walked in and I I turned around. She'd never been to the chemist before. And I turned around and saw her and she it really took my breath away. I thought, oh, look at that vision. It was like a I had actually thought it was one of those cardboard cutouts (laughs) of um, a glamorous woman that you see in the (laughs) chemist. And then realised it was Audrey and I was so thrilled to see her. But as she moved towards me and the closer she got, I knew something was terribly wrong. I think I first noticed that her belt was slightly twisted and then as she got closer, you could see that her eyeshadow was smudged, her mascara, her eyelashes on one eye, the lashes had fallen almost off, that her rouge was far too bright, that her lipstick was on her teeth and below the bottom lip and that she was shaking. And it was a moment of terror for Mm. me. Mm. I felt terrified for her. I felt it was a moment of nothing's ever going to be Mm. the same again. Mm. You just knew that 
the person who you thought was the most beautiful together in your whole life, something was deeply wrong and it was a visual thing. And then I realised that there was a slight tremor and that was the beginning of the knowledge that she was really not coping. And um, she eventually, she took her own life, which was um, devastating for, for the whole family. How did the news reach your family that your Aunt Audrey had died? We were having dinner the night my aunt died. And I think I remember my mother had a friend from school who was visiting. And my mother was very weak, I remember, but she came to the table. And the phone rang and um, my mother answered the phone. My father then went in and he stayed He then stayed at the table with the guest and my mother called my sister and I into the bedroom and just said very simply, Audrey's gone. And she said it with, um, she wasn't grief stricken as she said it. She said it as if it were an inevitability somehow, which shocked me. And I thought, you've all known things and no one has spoken of this. And I think there was a slight feeling in me of, not of betrayal, but of the the sadness and the uselessness of not sharing things. I think it occurred to me how important it is to, to share these things with people you trust and love. Broadcast. Podcast. This is Conversations with Sally Sara. Find more conversations anytime on the ABC Listen app or go to abc.net.au slash conversations. Heather, I want to take you back to the day of your final HSC exam for geography. What happened when you went to say goodbye to your mum that morning? Look, I went in to say goodbye to mum and that was the time when you'd go and they, the school required you to study at home and then you would go in just before the exam. And I'd done all my exams. This was my final one. I went into my mother's bedroom to say that I was going to stay home and study and go in later and she said that she wanted me to go into school and study. She didn't want me to stay home and she said it with great determination. So I thought, okay, um, I knew I wasn't going to go and leave because I could sense that her health was definitely failing. She was very um, ill. Um, And I just had this feeling that I mustn't leave her. So there was a boy who lived across the road who was in my year at school, who I have to say I quite fancied. And um, we'd never spoken really. We didn't know each other well. But I walked over, he was smoking a cigarette on the fence and asked him if I could come and study at his place because his house look directly across at our house and I could keep an eye on our house and then go in and do the exam. We went, I went into his bedroom. Uh, we were both studying. He put on a record and we were listening to the music and I was sitting on the floor with him. And uh, before I knew what we were kissing, then we were sort of just, we were fully closed in my, you know, to the knee school uniform with jumper. It was, it was winter time. But we were sort of just began to roll around on the floor a little. It was my very first experience of, you know, being even that intimate with anyone with, and certainly with a man. And um, I remember pushing him away and standing up and seeing the window over his desk, which went straight across to the front of our place. And there was an ambulance out the front and my mother was being wheeled on a gurney into the ambulance and our neighbour was standing on the side of the street and she was crying. And I just, I couldn't believe what I was looking at. And yet there was inevitability that this was going to happen. I knew somehow that that's why I, I just knew she was doing something that day that I had to be there for. And as you do, you think very quickly. So many thoughts are going through your head at once. You don't know which direction to turn in. And you're thinking, I've got to do this, I've got to do that. And I just ran and um, found myself standing over her as she was being um, put into the ambulance and she looked up at me and uh, the difficult thing was there was a look of disappointment on her face, a real disappointment that I was there. Why do you think, Heather? Why was she disappointed? I think that I was there. She didn't want me to see her like that. She'd kept this secret for so long and she'd done so well at it and no one seemed to have ever brought it up and somehow she must have felt, I've done it. 
and I don't know what she was thinking that when she died we would all just go, where did she go? I don't know. I don't think she thought that far ahead. Or She was just sort of, I think, so determined for no one to look at herself pittingly or, uh, and, and that she'd somehow achieved it that the look of disappointment I interpreted to be that she'd failed. The ambulance disappeared. Um, it went to the local hospital, which was very close to our house, and I just ran to school. I did the exam. I came out and one of my teachers, who our family was very close to, said, your mother's been taken to Sydney Hospital, hurry, and her husband was a doctor who had called her, and I ran towards the hospital, saw my father in the ambulance with her, and um, uh, that was the last time I saw her. Heather, after your mum died, there was a, a letter from her that was placed on the end of the bed for you to read. What did that say? Uh, in the letter, she told me how much she loved me. Uh, she told me that I'd been a great joy of her life. Um, and she told me that she had made the decision not to tell because of that um, assignment that I had, that debate topic, Ignorance is Bliss. And she also told me that she was intensely tired and that I should be happy for her to get to get rest. She'd put such care and thought into to making sure that we had something of what she was thinking. And I still have that letter and treasure it and, yeah. How did you know that you wanted to be an actor? Um, I didn't know I wanted to be an actor. I didn't, I had no understanding that acting was a, had a profession, you could have a career being an actor. I didn't understand that at all. I hadn't been exposed to actors. I didn't go to many theatre productions. So I think my, my understanding of acting was really originated through a girlfriend of mine who lived in Canberra and she had got into NIDA as a stage manager and she invited me to stay with her in Sydney. And I moved into a house uh, with her and three other stage managers and a designer. And it was really wonderful. Like that really opened my eyes up to the theatre. I want to fast forward, Heather, to your 29th birthday. And a friend of yours gives you a special present, a session with a clairvoyant of all things. What does that clairvoyant tell you about who you're going to meet and what's going to happen? I met this beautiful woman. It was a birthday present to see this clairvoyant. She lived in a nursing home. She wasn't supposed to practice clairvoyance, so I had to pretend I was her granddaughter. (laughs) So I arrived with cakes and she was so happy. We had this funny little pretense going on. And initially she, you know, she read some cards and looked at my palm and did some tea leaves or something and she was so sweet but said nothing of any significance to me and I just thought, how charming. And I had a little tape recorder. She asked me to tape things and then suddenly she said, that's it, time to time to do it. And I realised that was just a prelude to something more. I think she was, I don't know what that was about. But she then, I pressed my tape recorder and she then went on to say the most succinct things that then within 48 hours came true. She told me that I was going to go on a trip and it wasn't easy, it was going to be complicated, but I must do it, that I was going to be offered a job. She told me that I was going to meet a man and he would be broad shoulders, tapered at the waist. She said I was going to meet my guardian angel in life and it would make itself known to me. She said she didn't know if it would be a human being or an animal, but it would make itself known to me, which I thought was strange wording. She told me that I was going to be surrounded by silver as far as the eye could see. And they were pretty much her words. And I played the tape to a few people afterwards and they couldn't (laughs) believe it either. Anyway, I thanked her and I left and I went home and there was an answering machine, which we all had, with our messages on it. And my agent, Bill Shanahan, had left a message saying, call me immediately, Uh, you're wanted in Broken Hill. An actress has pulled out and it's a, a film in Broken Hill. But he said there's one complication, it's the pilot strike, so there are no planes, so you're going to have to go by army hangar. So I got the army planes, two different army planes, with men in fatigues the following morning and arrived at midnight in Broken Hill. I was picked up by Martin, who was the um, cinematographer, the first AD and the director, at about midnight and the following day worked on the set, met Martin 
didn't think that much of him at the time. <laughs> but um, we ended up um, all having dinner together. I went to use the bathroom and when I came back, he was gone. And that's when I first noticed him was his absence. But we ended up talking, getting to know each other. We ended up as, um, I suppose we did back then, just went and slept together. <laughs> so he invited me to his hotel room. We made love and then afterwards, it was one of those hotel rooms, those really standard 1970s hotel rooms yep. where you've got the, the concrete um, blasted um, ceilings and the old carpet and just one bench down the side, a bed pushed up against the wall. And afterwards I had my back pressed against the wall and I was trying to see him but there was a large aluminium framed window um, so he was a silhouette because the light from the Hilltop Hotel um, neon lights were shining through. So I couldn't see his face. I could just see his silhouette. And as I was, fo and it was pouring with rain outside as well. And as I was just focusing on him, uh, trying to see him, I noticed that his head and his shoulders um, created this silhouette of, of like a mountain range of his head, his shoulder tapering and at the waist going down to his legs. And behind him, I realised the only other thing I could see was like sheets of rain coming down, like like silver streamers with the light coming through it. And in that moment, he said to me, I feel like I'm your guardian angel. And I just froze and didn't say anything and sort of wanted him to leave, quite frankly. I was, thought it was all a bit weird. And then he bent over and picked up a, out of his jeans pocket a silver ingot that he'd bought me that day, which is... Broken Hill is the city of silver. So anyway, um, we both freaked. I didn't tell him about that, but um, months later I played him the tape and he couldn't believe. He said, I have no idea why I said that. I felt so <laughs> stupid saying it. So that was just one of those bizarre, extraordinary things that have happened. And um, I, I thanked her. I did contact her and I told her and she wasn't remotely surprised you eventually moved in with, with Martin, mm -hmm. who's become your husband uh, since. What do you think was going on in the back of your mind when he eventually proposed to you, given your experience with your mum and her illness? I, I felt that I was definitely going to be with Martin, that we'd, we'd spend our lives together, whether that meant marriage or not. Um, marriage didn't particularly interest me. I didn't quite understand... Um, whether people needed to be married. I didn't, hadn't really thought a lot about it. But Martin proposed to me and I just said no straight away. Why? I, I said no and I know he was so hurt. I said no because it, it was such an instant reaction in me and I didn't understand it at the time, but I realised, of course, later that I um, thought that my fate would be my mother's Despite these strong feelings, you take the courageous and and loving path to to get married to Marty. You have two beautiful boys, Seamus and Finn, and then you start to feel a lump in your breast. What did you notice? Um, I noticed a lump in my breast. It was only a small lump. Um, it was like the size of a tiny shriveled up pea. It was quite hard. Um, I'd been to the doctor a few times about it um, because I'd only just finished breastfeeding. I think the doctor thought, oh, it's probably just a cyst or it's some milk duct. And I didn't, I went for mammograms, but I didn't know you could have ultrasounds and the doctor hadn't recommended it, which she probably didn't think was necessary because the mammograms were clear. But the lump was quite high and then it dawned on me that maybe the mammogram wasn't capturing it. So I eventually... She suggested I have a mammogram and I went immediately and had it done. So that was three years after I'd found the lump. So it had progressed by the time they did the mammogram and saw it straight away and then did the biopsy. Then the cancer had progressed to the lymph nodes, which is where cancer, if, if it's not contained, the breast cancer, it will go towards your lymph nodes and therefore the danger once it's in the auxiliary nodes is that it can travel to the rest of the body. So it was stage three and fortunately I'd got it by then. How did you take in this diagnosis when you were a young mum and all your thoughts back to your mum's situation? Well, I just thought 
I mean, I remember this loud noise coming out of my mouth when the doctor rang me and it was a very primal sound. I was in a rehearsal room, so it really shocked me. And I think it was, it was definitely a feeling like I knew this day would come. It was the inevitability of it and what we were talking about before, that there's something deep inside, something very primal that you somehow think you are connected intrinsically to your family and somehow you will repeat their stories. So after that initial shock, um, I then got into action and I think it was much harder for Martin, my husband, um, because the children were too young to understand. They were two and four years old. They couldn't understand. And I think I took definitely guidance from the way my mother dealt with it was just to be stoic, uh, to be stoic and to get information and just get through it. Um, which is, and I decided to tell everyone. I didn't keep it a secret. I did the reverse to what she did. I just went, no, nope, I'm telling everybody, <laughs> which I also don't think is a particularly good idea. <laughs> but that was what I chose to do. And I um, had wonderful specialists, you know, brilliant doctors. But the treatment did take two years. It was two years of treatment. And I think it was very difficult on Martin. He developed shingles out of the stress of it and other it's not surprising, problems. Is it? I think mm. it's really hard mm. on the partners and the friends. After going through this treatment, that disrupted your work and also Martin's work, which placed a lot of financial pressure uh, on both of you. In 2006, you found an anonymous letter in your mailbox. What was inside that? Mm, it was envelope? so extraordinary. We had a very difficult time. Of, of no work at all, neither of us could get any work. And uh, so that was also putting enormous stress, particularly on Martin. Uh, we just kept taking more and more lines of credit. We had a house, thank goodness, that we were able to sell. But before we'd, I think we'd just put the house on the market. I don't think it was publicised yet, but we were definitely going to sell the house. And I went to the letterbox and normally there were bills. Very rarely you got a handwritten letter, but there was this beautiful handwriting and I opened it. And it was a letter from a Mrs. Anon. And in the letter she said that she had always admired my work and that she and her husband were well off and that they had recently come into some money and they had decided to start giving the money away to people um, whose work they admired and that she knew that actors were poorly paid and wanted to be of some assistance. It was a bank cheque for $30,000 from, from the city and I rang the bank and I tried to find out who it was and I, we put it in the drawer and we just, I asked three people who I knew had money who might have done this and they all said no, wasn't me and I believed them. So in the end, um, Martin said, well, whoever this is, let's bank it and see what happens. And within, I think with, by the next day, the money appeared in our account and I still don't know who that was from. Um, I've chosen to to think it was a theatre lover, someone who'd been to the theatre and maybe had seen me because only two weeks before I'd done a workshop, the first job back I did a workshop, a two-day workshop, and I was bald. And whether this person had been, we had an audience, and whether this person had been an audience member, I have no idea. What do you think that anonymous donation and letter, what, what did that teach you about kindness? Oh, look... It's beyond being about the money. The money was, uh, you know, it saved us. The money meant that we didn't have to panic. The money meant that we could sell the house and try and get a good price for it. it money meant that we, well, it was just extraordinary. It was amazing. So the money itself was incredible. But what it taught me was there is, there is such goodness and such kindness out there. And for people to do it anonymously, I mean, anonymously or not, had they put their name on it, it would have been just as extraordinary. But to do it anonymously was amazing. And I'm now on the um, foundation board of the Sydney Theatre Company and all theatre companies only exist by the kindness of its strangers, basically, mm. of its philanthropy. Otherwise, they would not exist. They could not do productions. I, I'm just, I feel so indebted to people who have money, who have enough money that they feel they want to contribute towards charities, towards anything that's important to them, anything that they have a passion for. And I would say that the arts is not a high one for many people um, and there are many more needy or people in need before our art forms, obviously, but I believe our art forms are immensely important and they 
reflect our society and that for people to to donate um, towards any art form is remarkable. And then towards an individual artist is, is really incredible. Heather, last year in 2022, your cancer returned. It came back just as you're about to launch into a, a really pivotal role on the stage. What was the feeling for you when that diagnosis came through again? It was completely different this time. Firstly, it's 17 years since the last one. My kids are now, um, you know, 22 and 24. I was, I felt the lump. So the lump was near the, where the other lump had been removed. So I thought that'd be highly unlikely because of all the treatment I'd had. Um, I went and had biopsy and my same specialist, he rang me and said, I'm sorry, Heather, it is cancer again. I was so thrown but not worried. I was immediately determined not to let it be a repeat of last time. I would not let it take over my life. I would not let it become a focus. I would, the work I was doing now felt so important to me that it was the only thing I wanted to focus on. So I immediately got to work and um, saw the specialists gathered lots and lots of information, contacted City Theatre Company immediately. They were brilliant and and uh, rescheduled the show. Uh, the TV series Love Me I was also doing, they rescheduled. So I had all these jobs and they all just got together and went, well, shift the dates, we'll do everything we can, which was no small feat. And then so I was able to just t- totally concentrate on making sure that I got through this very quickly and quietly. And... Uh, Gratefully, it hadn't spread and I'd got it very quickly. So I had um, a remarkable surgery um, <laughs> that they certainly weren't offering last time <laughs> where your, your stomach gets, trans- your, your, your stomach flesh gets put up and made a, another breast for you. I mean, it's quite incredible. So after a 10 and a half hour surgery and healing from that, was able to go straight on and do um, uh, Susie Miller's extraordinary play, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. The play RBG was about the life of the former US Supreme Court justice. Why did the story of this woman half a world away connect so strongly for you? Look, firstly, she's the most remarkable woman. She was and still is, but um, so formidable, so direct, so clear, such a visionary. But on a personal level, when I read more and more about her, and there are so many books you can read about her and about her life and you can, and in her own words, I felt I had so many connections with her, which is also why I think Susie thought that I'd be great to play the role. Susie Miller, Susie the playwright. Miller, sorry. Susie Miller's the playwright who wrote the remarkable Prima Facie and many, many other brilliant plays. And we're very close friends. And I think she also saw these echoes and connections that I could... Um, relate to so strongly. One was that she was brought up in a Jewish family, as I was, although I was, it wasn't a strict Jewish family, but there was a Jewish influence. My mother was Jewish, her mother was Jewish. She adored her mother and was greatly influenced by her mother, as as I was. She married a man called Marty, and I married a man called Marty. She lost um, her sister developed meningitis and and died when she was young. Um, my son developed meningitis, thankfully did not die, but there was the connection of the meningitis. Um, she had cancer three times in her life. Um, I've had cancer twice and hopefully not another time, but don't maybe when I get as old as she was, no, I might no, again. No. <laughs> um, but she experienced herself, uh, you know, studying law, trying to get into law firms, discrimination, uh, not only as a woman, but being Jewish as well. I have not experienced those things. However, nevertheless, there is definitely discrimination. And as I was growing up, I would say definitely women have not had the voice that they have now. So there were just so many things about her that I, that resonated with me, but also so on a personal level, I felt that I could understand what she went through in terms of the treatments she had, in terms of her love of her husband, in terms of her passion for her work, in terms of her commitment for wanting to uh, represent women, in terms of her love of her mother and her family and her love of the arts. And she had a deep love of opera. 
and music. And so I just felt, and her great feeling of fairness for people. So I just felt, I, apart from wanting to represent her, apart from wanting to say her words and get her message across to people who may not know her story, I wanted to step inside of her emotional life, which was a real honour to do. This this role of playing Ruth Bader Ginsburg, this is a, a one-woman show, so you had to learn around 11,500 words <laughs> to play this role, which blows my mind. How do you think back to that little girl who was using the chalkboard in in the in the wardrobe to teach herself to then go on to become an actor later in life who can memorise and make sense of thousands and thousands of words. Well, this is where line learning is. I think people are always so interested in how do you learn all those lines? And it's not about reading words. For me, learning lines, if, if something is well written, a lot of it's, you've got to learn it, but so much of the work is done for you. So yes, I had to learn it, but so much of it is for me, I talk onto my phone often and listen back, but also once you've read, you know, I read something a number of times before um, I would ever read it aloud, for instance, so I'm really, really, really familiar with it. But you're looking always in learning lines, for me, it's about connections. It's about finding connections between thoughts, connections, and the same thing I guess I was doing as a little girl, I was trying to find connections. I was teaching myself to find a connection with learning. What do you think your mum would think of the woman you've become? Oh, I think she'd be thrilled that I did acting. She didn't know that I was going to. She wouldn't, she didn't know that at the time. In fact, I remember when I did plays at school in that last year of her life, she couldn't come and see any of them. Um, She was too unwell to come. And I remember thinking, oh, what a shame. She'd love to, I think she'd really enjoy that. I think she'd be really pleased I'm doing... I think she'd just be really pleased I'm doing something I love. She'd be so happy I'm doing something I love, which is why I encourage my kids, um, despite hearing on the news how tough life is and despite hearing how everyone needs to have so much money, I try really hard not to focus on the finances and say, find the thing you love doing, just find what you love and keep going at it. Heather, thank you. Thank you so much. Heather Mitchell was my guest on Conversations today. I'm Sally Sara. Thanks for listening. You've been listening to a podcast of Conversations. For more Conversations interviews, please go to the website abc.net.au slash conversations. Ever feel clueless during smart convos? Same here. Can't keep up with everything? Don't sweat it. We're in this together. I'm Tegan Taylor, unveiling your new curiosity quencher, Quick Smart. I'll be chatting with clever people about current topics like the ADHD boom, opting out of the law, Disney as a religion, and AI stealing our jobs. Just give me 10 minutes, once a week. I'll be quick, you'll be smarter. It's Quick Smart. Find it now on the ABC Listen app.